Shalom, everyone. Shalom. Good to be in the house of the Lord today. How many feel the presence of the Lord here? What a mighty outpouring. Amen. Well, last night I got a chance to be a part uh, of the Four Square Rabbis Caucus, uh, their second annual Passover, and Jack Hayford is really on board with the Messianic movement, and we're so glad that... Uh, you know, the origins of the Foursquare Church, Amy Simple McPherson, had a great outreach to the Jewish community in L.A. and Hollywood. And they were able to literally revive that. They had um, articles of her throughout the newspaper of the day um, showing where she was reaching out to the Jewish community before there really was um, a great, great uh, Messianic movement like there is today. And he put out an article of why stand with Israel today. And so I made copies for all of us. Um, and I'd like for you to get a copy. I just want to read something that he wrote in reference to Israel. Why stand with Israel today? Jack Hayford. Israel is a land about which God says uniquely, prophetically, redemptively, and repeatedly in the Bible, this is mine. God refers to Israel as he does to no other land on earth. Israel was raised up to be a light to the Gentiles. The church at its inception was virtually entirely Jewish, and it remained so until the gospel began to spread. Ultimately, the gospel spread to Antioch, where the first Gentile uh, congregation began, the base from which the gospel spread into all the world. In the book of Romans, chapters 9 through 11, the Apostle Paul deals with the question of the Jews in God's providence and purpose. Within the whole of the Bible, these three chapters virtually stand alone as an elaboration of the theology of God's dealing with the Jews. Amen. The Jews were the first fruit, the first people through Abraham to understand a covenant God. They then relayed the riches of that truth to the world and through their agency the Messiah came into the world. The word of God calls Jews the root and Gentiles the branches. We are reminded that while because of unbelief, some of them were broken off, and you stand it by faith, we are not to become haughty, but to fear or reverence. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he might not spare you either. When the fullness of the Gentiles is completed, all of Israel will be what? Saved. Saved. Why stand with Israel today? We are living in a sobering moment in history that calls us as believers in Jesus Christ or Yeshua the Messiah to take a stand with Israel. We could be people of the last hour. We are not to be passive in the face of prophecy. We are called to pray with what? Passion. To intercede. To minister according to the words of the Savior who said it is not our task to speculate when the end will be. It is our responsibility to do kingdom business until he comes. Luke 19.13 this is not about politics. This is about the Word of God. But the political ramifications are extremely dramatic. Scripture declares there will, be, there will come a time when all nations of the world will, world, world will turn against Israel. It is so highly conceivable this could happen in our time that it is critical to outline why we should stand with Israel Amen. today. He gives eight reasons why. And uh, I encourage you to read this article. I'm really encouraged that pastors, especially in the full gospel, Pentecostal, charismatic movements, are starting to realize how important the Holy Spirit's outpouring is to the Jew first before it is to the nations. Because they realize God is doing something unique among the Jewish people. I am going to share a message with you in the next few minutes uh, from the Parshat Shmini. 
and as we take a look at a message called Taking Hold of the Horns of the Altar. Will you say that with me? Taking Hold of the Horns of the Altar. Now, this brings us to a, a great welcome that we should welcome our new guests because we have at least a few that are new here today. Let's give them a welcome. With Ruchim Habaim, which means welcome. Glad you joined us today. We read in the Torah portion, Leviticus 9.1 through 11.47. Um, we actually had a different uh, passage that we read, 2 Samuel, not Ezekiel. And then we had Hebrews, um, we actually did check 10, I guess I forgot to change that. Um, our read today is in Leviticus 9.1, where it says, On the eighth day, say eighth day, eighth day. Eighth day. Shmini, Moshe called Aharon, his sons, his leaders uh, of Israel, and said to Aharon, Take a male calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering, both without defect. Tamim. And offer them before Adonai. Tell the people of Israel, Take a male goat for a sin offering and a calf and a lamb, both a year old, without defect, for a burnt offering. Now we know the calf, the egel, is because of chet ha-egel, which is the sin of the golden calf. So it's a calf for a calf. Uh, verse 14 says, The young bull will be for a sin offering. And, and it was brought, and Aharon and his sons laid their hands on the head of the bull for the sin offering. After it had been slaughtered, Moshe took the blood and put it on the what? Horns, Horns of the altar. You have a picture of the altar here. And it says, All the way around with his fingers, thus purifying the what? The altar. This is a way to purify with blood. Okay? Uh, the latter part of verse 15 says, The remaining blood he poured out on the base of the altar and consecrated it uh, to make atonement for it. Notice the word atonement. Uh, I'm going to go move over to Exodus chapter 27, verse 1. And this is the construction of the brazen altar. And he says in verse 2, You shall make its horns on its four what? Corners. Corners. So when I was reading this this week, I thought about the four corners of the four horns, and I thought about the four corners of the earth. And I thought about God revealing himself to the four corners of the earth. I think about how important the four corners, or the four directions, or the four winds are to the book of Revelation. That the shofars or the ram's horns can't blow until God has secured his righteous, the 144,000, 12,000 from every tribe of the 12 tribes of Israel. Because God has to protect his own from the judgment of the little horn. The judgment that comes through the horns of the beast that want to attack the Jewish people. And as I think about all the passages in the Bible that deal with horns, I ask the question, what are these horns? What are these horns of the altar? What are these horns on the four corners? Just like we have four corners of the earth. And we know that the four corners have horns on each one, likened to an animal's horn, like a ram's horn. In fact, chapter 30, verse 10 says, And Aaron said, Make atonement upon its horns once a year with the what? Blood. With the what? Blood. With the what? Blood. blood. Hadam. The blood of this sin offering. Hadam haolah. Or actually the sin offering, hatat. And here we have the blood of the sin offering is made for what? For atonement. How often? Once a year. Once a year. Now, if you remember, we were reading the Torah portion this, uh, uh, this morning, and two sons of Aaron die, Nadav and Avihu. Nadav, Mr. Free Will, and Avihu, the guy who says, well, he's my father. So Nadav and Avihu thought, well, with our own free will, because Aaron's our father, we can do what he does. The passage deals with drunkenness, which is not allowed when you're officiating as a priest. So, possibly, Nadav and Abihu were a little drunk from the celebration, but they were not consecrated to do that work anyway. It was only Aaron, their father, who could not drink on the job. We had to make sure he couldn't drink any wine until after he was done uh, officiating as a priest. They died. And because of that, Leviticus 16 gives us the requirement for only once a year going to the Holy of Holies with the blood of the sacrificial animals, especially dealing with the two goats. Now, if you look at this, it says once a year he shall make what? Atonement. Atonement upon it through your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. The word horn in Hebrew is karen. Just like, very similar to the English name karen, which in Greek means pure. 
But in this sense, Karen means a horn. And it's a symbol of what? Power. Power. The brazen altar had these horns. These projections at the four corners of the altar, or burnt offering, were of one piece with the altar and were made of acacia wood overlaid with brass, or we know that brass, or what's sometimes called bronze, is really the copper with a little tin. In Ezekiel's altar specifications, their position is described as being on a level with the altar hearth, which is that place of, where the fire would be burning. We also see that fugitives seeking asylum might cling to the horns of the altar, as did um, Adon, Adon Yahu, which uh, we know Adonijah, um, he is in 1 Kings 150 clinging to the horns of the altar. It says, which in one proof among many that worshipers had at times access to the neighborhood of the altar on certain occasions, as at the consecration of Aaron and his sons, as found in Exodus 29.12, as a sin offering for one of the people of the land, as seen in Leviticus 4.30, the horns were touched with sacrificial blood. Amen. Now, the second place where there were horns was also on the golden altar. This is the golden altar of incense. The altar of incense, standing in the outer chamber of the sanctuary, had also four horns, four ram's horns, which were covered with gold. These were touched with blood in the case of a sin offering for a high priest for the whole congregation if they had sinned unwittingly or un, uh, unknowingly, in other words. Because the sacrifice for sin was only if you didn't know it was sin. That's why Hebrews chapter 10, I believe it's verse 26, says, If you sin willfully, after you have received the knowledge of the truth, there's no more sacrifice for sin for you, because the sacrifice for sin was never offered for anything done willingly. Only for a one-time effect to teach you that something dies when you sin, that the wage of sin is death. It's never meant to be an ongoing cycle. Let's just keep killing animals. God is not someone who just wants to murder animals. He was saying, I need to use a lesson to show you the severity of of what happens when you sin. The wages of sin is death. It's only to be done once. And it was a teaching tool for the priest to teach the nation of Israel. Now, this is what's powerful about this. We see the horn that was used for the brazen altar of sacrifice. We see the horn that was used for the golden altar of incense. We also see that it was used for asylum for those that would be seeking to run from judgment. As is found in 1 Kings 147, it says, And moreover the king's servants have gone to bless our Lord King David, saying, May God make the name of Solomon better than your name, and may he make his throne greater than your throne. Continuing on, it says, Then the king bowed himself on the bed, and also the king said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who has given one to sit on my throne this day, while my eyes see it. Amen. Verse 49 says, So all the guests who were with uh, uh, Adoni, ya, Adoniyahu, Adoniyahu were afraid and arose, and each one went his way. Now Adoniyahu was afraid of Solomon, so he arose, and he went and took hold of the horns of the altar. How powerful were these horns that he thought, maybe if I could just grab a hold of them, I will not be afraid of Solomon and I will not receive judgment and I will not be removed from my place. I will somehow attach myself, take hold of this power that the horn represents. Now, how is this possible? Let's look what it says in verse 51. And it was told to Solomon, saying, Indeed, Adoniyahu is afraid of King Solomon. For look, he has taken hold of the horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear to me today that he will not put his servant to death with the sword. He was running. He was seeking asylum. He was saying, If there's any place I can go, I know there's power in those horns. I know when the priest put the blood on those horns, I know there's atonement. So maybe there's atonement for me if I could just grab a hold of the horns. If I could grab a hold of the power that those horns represent. 
The four corners of those horns representing God's mercy to the four corners of the earth. Maybe somehow I will be atoned for. Maybe I will not be put to death. Maybe I will see, be able to find asylum for the judgment that could come upon me under Solomon's reign. Now, one chapter over, chapter 2, verse 27. So Solomon removed Abiatar from being priest to the Lord, that he might fulfill the word of the Lord, which he spoke concerning the house of Eli at Shiloh, or Shiloh. Verse 28 says, Then news came to Joab, or Joab, that defected to who? Uh, ad, uh, um, ad, Absalom. I don't, um, I'll keep wanting to say his name in English, and then I'm going to say it in Hebrew. His name is like Melchizedek, Melchizedek, but Adoniyahu. Though he had defected to Absalom, or Abishalom, so Joab, or jo Joab, fled to the tabernacle of the Lord and took hold of the horns of the altar. You see two men here, uh, Adonijah and Joab, that actually go and take hold of the horns of the altar, of the brazen altar in the tabernacle. Technically, they shouldn't be doing this. But technically, shouldn't David also refrain from putting on the ephod, the priestly tunic, and eating the showbread, and dancing before the Lord, before the ark? God didn't judge him because he had a heart to praise him. He had a right heart before him. There is question whether these men had a right heart. Therefore, what they were seeking for wasn't necessarily what they received. But I have to tell you, there is a type of shadow here. That if we as believers have a right heart to go to God and seek God and draw close to God, karav, in the korban, in the offering, just like the blood that's applied to the horns, symbolic of the power of the animal that is wrestling with another animal, so the power that's symbolic of that, there is a power in prayer, there's a power in atonement, there's a power that is available for the believer today. I want you to look at what possibly we could do with a right heart if we were to seek the presence of God the way David sought the presence of God. That God made a promise to David, promise to Solomon, and to all his children hereafter. Amen? Amen? Just like he did to Abraham, just as he did to Isaac and Jacob, just as he did through Moses. So, let's take a look at the first reference of the horns that are connected to this altar. We find it, of course, with Abraham. Don't we find most things in the law first mentioned with Abraham? Amen. We see in Genesis 22, in the Akidah Yitzhak, the binding of Isaac. Can you say that? The binding, binding of, Isaac. of Isaac. Isaac, Akidat Yitzhak, or the Akedah, as it's sometimes said in the Ashkenazi community. <laughs> Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a what? Ram. A ram caught in the bushes by its horns. This is the reason for a shofar to be used to this day. A ram's horn. It's because the ram was caught in the bushes by its horn. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering. Here's the connection to the sacrifices. A burnt offering. A burnt offering. Here's the connection to the sacrifices. A ram. A ram. Not the lamb of God in the future who will take away the sin of the world, but a substitution for now. That when you laid your hands on the head of the animal, it was a substitution for you to make atonement. Amen? Amen. Watch this. It says, it was for a burnt offering in place of, in substitution for his son. Abraham called the place what? Adonai Hirei. Adonai will see to it. Or as it's traditionally said, Adonai or the Lord provides. As it is said to this day, watch this, here's the connection. On the mountain, Adonai is seen. Moriah. Moriah can refer to um, uh, uh, teaching as uh, more. Um, it can refer to seeing. It can also refer to the connection to Yire, the place where God will be seen, or he will see to it, or he will provide. So when you see this law first mentioned here, and this binding of the sacrifice, everybody say binding of Isaac. Binding of Isaac. Say binding of the sacrifice. Binding, binding of the sacrifice. sacrifice. Many of the animals would have to be bound because they're not like the lamb that doesn't wrestle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the reason you have to bind the sacrifice is because the animal wants to fight. Because he wants to live. Mm -hmm. 
How many of us fight God every once in a while? Trying to fight. Our arms are too short to box with God. Amen? We can't fight with God. But we have to, they'd have to bind that animal because he would try to get loose before the kosher cutting or sacrifice could take place. So look what Psalms 118, our Passover passage of the Halel, says about this use of horns and the sacrifice. Psalms 118, verse 26, this is part of the Halel, right? Passover's coming. Pesach is coming. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Say this with, with me in Hebrew. Baruch Abba B'Shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We know they said that for Yeshua. Yeshua says, when I come back, we'll say it again. So notice this connection to Yeshua. Notice this connection to sacrifice and to the horn. Watch this. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. That's the temple. God is the Lord. Or Elohim is, is Yah. And he has given us what? Light. Light. Revelation. Illumination. Fire. His presence. He's given us all this. So what are we going to do? We're going to bind the sacrifice with cords. Like the binding of Isaac. To the horns of the altar. Some translations say up to the horns of the altar. Meaning to prepare the blood for the horns of the altar. So they didn't necessarily tie the animal to the horns. But what they did was tie the animal down so that the sacrifice could be used for the horns of the altar. If Isaac wouldn't have allowed himself to be bound, maybe there wouldn't have been a ram caught in the bush. Maybe we would not have the connection to the horn and its sacrifice. <laughs> you, can't, you seen that law first mentioned? That Passover, that the Messiah coming, the sacrifice... And the horns are all connected to what's called a feastal sacrifice. A Passover sacrifice. Yeshua is the Lamb of God. What did Abraham say? The Lord will provide for himself a lamb. But for now, I'm going to give you one of these rebellious rams. Because you're going to learn how to bind that rebellious ram. And he's going to bind him with cords so that the blood can be placed on the horns of the now, let me give you the secret to the word horn. It's found in Habakkuk, or Habakkuk 3.3, 3, where it says, God came to Timon, the Holy One from Mount Paran. This is that uh, Judean desert. Selah, think about this. His glory covered the heavens. The earth was full of his praise. And his brightness was as the light. 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 Wait, 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 wait. God is the one who has given us what? Light. Light. So we can bind the sacrifice and run to the altar. So here we go. He says, And the brightness was as the light, and he had horns coming out of his hands. And there was the hiding or the secret of his power. <coughs> the horns, the karen in Hebrew, was the hiding or the secret of his power. What are horns symbolic of? Power. What's the horns of a ram symbolic of? The power of it. The horns of a bull, power of a bull. The horns of a goat, power of the goat. Right? Even what some translations call a unicorn. You know, well, no matter what that animal really is, we don't know. The Bible even talks about the false messiah, the Antichrist, being a little horn. Whose power will be broken when the horn is broken. Right? So the power of a kingdom or the power of God is seen symbolically in the horns, just like the power of Messiah and his coming is in the hiding of this symbol, or hidden secret of the symbol. Now, some translations will say rays, because it's like a cone shape. This, this horn is like a cone shape. And so, some translations say, well, it's light coming like a ray of light. This is one of the reasons why, if you ever look at the little statue of Moses, <coughs> have you ever seen the little horns on his head? Yes. You thought it looked like a billy goat, right? Mm -hmm. Or one of those pantheon little uh, imps, <laughs> little deities, little half, you know. Horse, half man, little little creatures, a little goat, like half goat, half man. No, that's not who Moses is. That's right. The artist was thinking that when it said horns for the height of his power, they were translating the word that rays were coming from Moses, Amen. from his face. Well, that same word can say horns were coming from him. But the word Karen, this cylindrical type of cone-shaped <laughs> protrusion, is speaking of anything that's coming forth from the strength of its source. 
So what's the strength or the power of the Messiah? Or God is coming in all his full glory. This symbol of Karen, the horn, is used as a symbol since the days of Abraham to represent the power that's caught in the thicket. <laughs> Just like the enemy will be caught <laughs> in the thicket. Yeshua wore a crown of thorns on his head to defeat the enemy. They would be caught in the thicket. So, this is why Revelation chapter 5 says that John wept because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll. The scroll of the Torah, the scroll of the prophets, the scroll of the revelation of God, the scroll of the covenant of God. Or to look at it. One of the elders said, don't weep. Behold who? The lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, Yehuda. The root of David, the descendant of David, has prevailed. Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, the root of David, stem of Jesse, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose the seven seals. So there are seven seals. But look at verse 6. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and the four living creatures, or these cherubim angels, and in the midst of the elders, the 24 elders, stood a lamb, is that like Abraham's lamb? A lamb as though it had been what? Slain. Slain. Slaughtered. Sacrificed. Having what? Seven, seven horns. horns. Now, this is how you understand this. Symbolically, seven means completion. Perfection. Entirety. Seven days in a week, right? Seven colors in the rainbow, spectrum of light. Uh, the ancients used to believe that there were seven visible uh, planetary uh, beings. So they had seven deities that they worshipped as the, the planets. Monday through Sunday, right? All that, that Monday was the moon, Tuesday was Mars, Wednesday was Mercury, Thursday was uh, Jupiter, Friday was Venus, Saturday was Saturn, and Sunday was the sun god. And those were all the deities they worshipped, because those were the visible, one, visible ones they could see. There are seven notes in uh, music before an octave, right? And so we see that seven is used throughout um, the Bible. And here it says there were seven horns. So replace seven, symbolic with its meaning, completion or fullness. And then replace horn with power. The lamb having the fullness of power. Or what Paul says that the lamb of God or that Yeshua the Messiah, he is the he is the power of God, and he is the wisdom of God. So the horns represent his power, and then seven eyes represent his wisdom, because he is the fullness of power, he's the fullness of wisdom. He's the power of God, he's the wisdom of God. Why? The Jews need a miracle, they need power. The Gentiles, the, Gen the Greeks, they need wisdom. They are philosophers. So Yeshua the Messiah is to both. Power to the Jew, wisdom to the Greek. Right? The Jews have the wisdom of the Torah. But they want to see the power of God to demonstrate. Right? The, the Gentiles didn't have the power of God, but they sought for wisdom, philosophy. So Yeshua becomes all things to all people, doesn't he? Now, this leads us to our first point, because when you look at this principal meaning of the horns of the altar and what it means to take hold of it, number one, we see that there is power in prayer. Amen. There is power in prayer because the altar of incense had four horns symbolic of power on their four corners. As it said in the priest, we mentioned uh, in Leviticus 4, 7, and the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of what? Sweet incense. Sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of meeting. And he shall pour the remaining blood of the bull at the base of the altar. Now, look at Psalms 141, verse 2. Where it says, let my prayer be set before you as what? Incense. Incense. And lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So before the priest could go into the Holy of Holies, he'd have to offer up on the four horns of the altar of incense. He'd have to uh, go before this altar before he could go into the presence of God. So the blood was applied. That tells us there must be power in prayer because when he's standing there offering the incense, there's power in prayer because of the horns that were connected to that altar. So the four corners, having four horns, shows the power of prayer or incense going up before God. In fact, we see that clearly when it tells us that the horns are used, it's put the blood on the horns of the altar of sweet incense. See the blood right here? Sweet incense before the Lord. The second thing it teaches us is there must be power in the blood itself. 
There's power in prayer, and there's power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Sounds pretty Jewish to me. <laughs> there's power in the blood, why? Because the blood makes atonement. And he shall put, Leviticus 16, 18, the Yom Kippur passage, he shall go out of the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it, and he shall put some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. What makes the power of the blood powerful? Applying it to the horns, symbolic of the power of that sacrifice. That there is power in the sacrifice of the blood of the Lamb. There's power in prayer. There's power in the blood. In fact, let me prove it to you. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 says, And they overcame him, Hasatan, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Wow. You see, there is power in prayer. There is power in the blood. But there's also power in the anointing. Power in the anointing. Today we literally had an anointing service, didn't we? God demonstrated my message. I didn't intend for that. He just demonstrated it. How I many know He knows exactly what He's doing? Amen. Even leading up to our 21 day fast up till um, Pesach. So there's power in the anointing. How do we know that? We know there's power in the anointing because we see it in Leviticus 8, verse 10. Now Moses had taken the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was therein and sanctified them and sprinkled there uh, of upon the altar how many times seven seven times and anointed the altar and all of its instruments and the laborer's foot to sanctify them and he poured the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him amen he anointed Aaron just like it said about Samuel anointing David in Shmuel, Shmuel uh, Aleph, or 1 Samuel 16, 13, then Samuel took the horn of what? Oil. Oil. And anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. From that day forward, then Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. See, David was anointed not like Saul, with a flask, an ordinary vessel of oil. He was anointed with a peculiar vessel, a ram's horn, because David was a peculiar vessel. Not only David was anointed this way, but look at 1 Kings. He says, Zadok the priest took a horn of the oil out of the tabernacle, and he anointed who? Solomon. Solomon. And they blew the trumpet, or the ram's horn. All the people said, God save King Shlomo. How funny. Uh, Joab and uh, Adoniahu, they didn't get refuge from the horn. But David did, and Solomon did. Because with the same horn, the blood was applied. The same horn, the anointing was applied. With the same horn, the oil was poured. With the same horn, the shofar was blown. Do you see the power in this horn, this ram's horn? This symbol of power? There's a power coming to attack Israel. Blow the ram's horn. What does that mean? The enemy's going to get caught in the thicket. Amen. The enemy's going to get caught in his own trap. The ram. It's coming. Do you remember when Daniel had a prophecy about a ram coming? Right? And a goat coming? And a bear? And a lion? All the enemies of Israel were seen as animals. And most of them had horns. And they would be broken. The fourth thing I want you to know about the horn, it tells it that there's power in the word. I love this one. There's power in the word. There's power in prayer. There's power in the blood. There's power in the anointing. That's because there's power in the word. Look at what Yeshua the Messiah said in Matthew 5, 17. He says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle. In Hebrew, it would be karen. But in Greek, it's very close. Kerea. I think it comes from the same root. Like skinoo, right? That he's tabernacled among us, the Messiah. From Shakan, same root cognate letters. I think it's the same thing here. It's a, it's a kind of a borrowed word. So, Karen and Kerea are the same meaning, a horn. So, it literally says, not one jot or one little horn will by no means pass away from the law or the Torah till all is fulfilled. 
here we see that the korea is a little horn. A part of speech, it's a noun, it's in the feminine form, korea. Phonetically, korea, korea. Um, it is an apostrophe looking symbol, like a little hook. Or the apostrophe or little hook symbol on the letters of the alphabet, distinguishing them from the little uh, uh, letters or separation stroke between letters. So the ancient Aleph was an ox head. This would be the Karea or the Karen, the horns of the ox. In modern Hebrew, you would say it would be the horn-like image, Karea, very similar to the Jot or the, the Iota or Yod, the Yud uh, the, of the first and second letter here of Ki Leolam, Ki Leolam Hasdo, right? His mercy endures forever. So here you have key leolam. Okay? So here we have a tittle here on the top, and then we have the jot. There's the jot and tittle. The smallest letter in Hebrew, or the smallest stroke of the pen of the scribe. Now I close with this last final point. He's not only showing us through the horn that there's power in prayer, not only that there's power in the blood, not only that there's power in the anointing, because fourth, there's power in the word. Most important out of all of this, it's a picture that there is power in the Messiah. Amen. How do we know this? I close with Luke chapter 1, verse 67. Then his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost to the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up the horn of salvation unto us. That anointed horn, that horn of the oil of the anointing, in the house of his servant who? David. David. That verse 70 says, And he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which, which were since the world began, saying that he would send us deliverance from our enemies, that the enemies like a ram would be caught in the thicket, and from the hands of all that hate us, that he might show mercy towards our fathers, and remember the Holy Covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham. See, this is what you might not know, and I close with this final prayer today. The Orthodox pray three times a day, if they're observant, like the Hasidic community, the Haredim, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Lubavitch uh, household. This is what they pray every day. May the seed of David... Your servant branch out speedily. And may his horn exalt in your salvation, or be exalted in your salvation. For in your salvation do we hope all day. Blessed are you who brings forth the horn of salvation. Amen. In Hebrew, this would be Karen Yeshua. Wow. Who is Yeshua? He is Karen Yeshua, the horn of our salvation. Do you receive this message today? Do you believe that there's power today in prayer? There's power in the blood. There's power in the anointing because there's power in the word because there's power in Messiah. Would you stand your feet today and receive this blessing? Stretch your hands for the blessing. Today we have had an anointing service and an anointed service and we know that the horns of the altar can be taken hold of today. Stretch your hands today like you're going to take hold of the horns of the altar. Yivarechacha Adonai v'yishmarecha Yair Adonai p'navilecha v'yihonecha Yisa Adonai p'navilecha v'yasirecha May the Lord Adonai shine His face upon you, be gracious to you with divine favor. May the Lord Adonai lift up His countenance upon you and give you perfect peace and star shalom, the Prince of Peace. Yeshua the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Horn of our salvation. In His name we pray, B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. God bless you today. Thank you, Lord. Shavuot Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you 
and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. May the Lord grant you his peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you And make His face to shine upon you And be gracious to you May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you May the Lord grant you His peace Give Erecha Adonai Vigishmerecha Yair Adonai Benavelecha Vihunecha Adonai, but I'm a lecher,